<coughs> it was possible. With this initiative, it was possible to leverage about 22 million euros of investment that contributed to promote the dramatization of the economy. But there are other indicators, such as the nearly 2 million euros of annual savings associated with the reduction of energy consumption or the reduction of more than 5,000 tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions. These results confirm the focus on building renovation following sustainability criteria is one of the most relevant measures to foster economic recovery in the post-COVID phase. At European level, this focus is recognized by the European Commission through the renovation wave. And Portugal will provide, under the Recovery and Resilience Plan, 610 million euros for energy efficiency and improving the environmental performance of buildings over the next five years. Of this, 300 million euros will be allocated to energy efficiency and environmental measures in residential buildings. The remaining 300, to be uh, precise, 310 million euros will be allocated to energy efficiency in public administration buildings and services. Ladies and gentlemen, the government approved this year the long-term strategy for building renovation, which includes a roadmap with indicative measures and goals for 2030, 2040, and 2050. And they are linked to meeting the, efficiency, the, the energy efficiency goals of the European Union. The main objective of this strategy is to achieve a decarbonized and highly energy efficiency building stock by transforming existing buildings into nearly zero energy buildings. With this strategy, a response is given as far as the need to develop and implement a long term strategy to promote the renovation of buildings is concerned, contributing to an increase in energy efficiency of the building stock. Among the objectives of decarbonization, the need to ensure a just, democratic and cohesive transition also stands out. To achieve this goal, it is necessary to strengthen the role of citizens as active agents in decarbonization and energy transition, creating a level playing field for all, fighting against energy poverty, developing instruments for the protection of vulnerable citizens and promoting the active involvement of citizens and territorial problems progress to this end it is necessary to fight energy poverty and improve the instruments for the protection of vulnerable customers defining a set of action measures aimed at one the need to ensure better housing conditions especially for human rehabilitation two the promotion of energy efficiency in buildings focusing on insulation measures and three the reduction of dependence on fossil fuels, in which the focus on decentralized electricity production based on renewable energy communities and on the valorization of collective systems can play a very relevant role in mitigating energy costs. The strategy main objectives is to combat energy poverty, protect vulnerable consumers and actively integrate them into the energy and climate transition. This is what we are really doing right now with the public discussion of the long-term strategy to fight energy poverty. To this end, it will be necessary to adopt and implement a set of action measures in the short, medium and long term, which are sustained over time and aligned with the national energy and climate strategy, creating the social conditions to identify, act and monitor households in this situation in an integrated, sustainable, and proactive way. I will conclude to say that to fight energy poverty, we have several instruments at our disposal. The social energy tariff to be applied to economically vulnerable and customers, which materialize in a discount compared to the values of the normal tariff. The extraordinary tariff support motivated by the sharp drop in temperature in the first half of January. It will uh, we help uh, and benefit about 5.2 million consumers. The reduction in the VAT rate for electricity from 23% to 30% in the consumption component 
with a contracted power up to 6.9 kVAs. The mobilization of funding to adjust to situations of energy poverty, as already mentioned. So, our objective in this area is very clear. Portugal seeks a path of sustainable growth based on decarbonization and energy transition, investing in a more competitive and resilient development model, reducing energy dependence, valuing natural resources, promoting the welfare of society while generating new job opportunities and wealth creation, protecting populations from the adverse effects of climate change. This is a strategic path for the country and it implies the mobilization of all active agents from scientists and researchers to businessmen and investors, from environmental protection organizations to consumers, from the media to ordinary citizens, so that we can face the challenges and size the opportunities of the energy and climate transition in a democratic, cohesive and inclusive manner so that Together, we can build a fairer society and a better future. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Minister. That's fantastic. And, it, and it's been great to hear that Portugal, um, with its presidency as well, continue to promote the EU as a leader in climate action, especially this year uh, leading up to COP26. So thank you very much for all of your words. It's all um, addressing you, it energy. It's great. Thank you very much. Okay, so for anybody who's just joined us, this is the Efficient Buildings Digital Days. We're running slightly behind time. We've had a couple of technical hitches, uh, but now we've got two sessions between now and midday. Both are gonna have plenty of discussions from our uh, expert contributors. The first session is on cities and regions and the path towards climate neutrality. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll be talking about building strategies in the post pandemic world. Uh, so for this first session, we've got three speakers. Each will speak for about five minutes on their topic. And after that, we'll have um, a questions for the speakers. So if you want to put questions into the panel, then we'll, we'll see if we can fit those in before we get to 11 o'clock. Um, so yeah, we're focusing on cities and regions at the core of the path towards climate neutrality. So we have three speakers. Our first speaker, I'm delighted to introduce Mayor Belinda Gottardi, Mayor of Castel Maggiore, which is a city in the metropolitan area of Bologna. Uh, the town in which Belinda has lived and knows very well, she's worked in a number of roles within the city council. And Belinda is a spokesperson on climate for the Council of European Municipalities and Regions and is a member of the board of the Covenant of Mayors. And uh, it's a, our pleasure she's going to talk on achieving EU targets by actions at local and regional levels. Hello, Belinda. Good morning, good morning to everybody. Thank you for the invitation and for the interesting discussion. This is exactly the problem we mayors are facing in this moment. So get out of COVID pandemic, managing a society in transition on several levels and fight against climate change. We also need to pay attention that the earth crisis won't be misused as a pretext for delaying urgent climate actions, but instead be used as an opportunity to shape systemic change. COVID pandemic has confronted the global community with major challenges, but we have also learned which mechanisms are useful for overcoming such global challenges. A strong political leadership, cooperation and coordinated responses and the active involvement of citizens made us want the virus and in the same way we can win the challenge against climate change. I'm going to share with you uh, some experiences made in recent months that could be concrete examples of what can be done. I start with the Covenant of Mayors, which is a network of mayors committed to achieving the objectives set by the European Union on climate and energy. In order to translate the political commitment into practical measures and projects, Covenant signatories commit to submitting within two years following the date of the local council decision, a sustainable energy and climate action plan. The plan outlines the key actions that mayors plan to undertake. And this is the beginning of a long-term process with the cities committed to reporting every two years on the implementation progress of their plans. Many towns have now their plan that includes actions on the public and private buildings, the industrial sector, public lightning, mobility, 
production of energy from renewable sources and actions to adapt to climate change. Some of the actions are already underway. Uh, most of our lamps, uh, old lamps, have been replaced with uh, LED uh, lights. There are plenty of uh, local solar communities that aim to create and share costs uh, and opportunities of uh, photovoltaic systems. Uh, a real cultural revolution is taking place on the issue of mobility. For example, in the metropolitan city of Bologna has been drawn up the first Italian urban plan for sustainable mobility. Networks of cycle paths have been created, so bike is now a real alternative to the car to go to work. And with the bike to work project, we give economic awards to employees and self-employed workers who go to work by bicycle in our area and they calculate the kilometers traveled by bicycle with an app and the more they pedal the more they earn uh, this project is also connected to the implementation of mobility manager who promotes better and more sustainable mobility among the users of our industrial areas pedestrian and cycle paths are also created along our rivers and canals as soft mobility also represents an opportunity for outdoor tourism the sustainable mobility plan does not only concern the bicycle, but also provides for the redefinition of public transport with the new tram and bus lines and the better timing of the metropolitan railway service. Another lesson we learned from pandemic is that smart working is not only a necessity to avoid contagion, but a new way of working that allows the reconciliation of times that reduces car travel and therefore reduces air pollution as well as traffic congestion. Talking about the active involvement of citizens, we are stimulating the birth of groups of persons who work to promote a new and sustainable lifestyle, which is in fact a great little revolution. I'm talking about simple projects like walking home to school paths, the correct differentiation of waste, the dissemination of good daily practices, but if we were able to promote widespread behavior, then we would really speed up the ecological transition process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belinda. Yeah, behavioral change is all part of it, isn't it? Yes, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on now. And our second speaker is Curzio Savelli, who is a coordinator of the Interreg Euromed Joint Secretariat, and he's been working on the program since 2008. So the program's headquarters are in Marseille in the south of France and are hosted by the Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur region. And now Interreg is starting the new program. So we're going to hear about the contribution of the Interreg Med program and looking ahead. So what can be expected for the phase from this year, 2021 to 2027? So Curzio, welcome. Thank you, thank you Vicky and good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by uh, a significant thank uh, for the organizer. And uh, this is exactly what we can do uh, all together in order to capitalize and to valorize better our uh, um, outcomes. Um, for sake of clarity, and in order also to ensure uh, the utilization of both official languages of the program, and I'm going to speak in French. So, uh, uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Le futur du programme MED. Uh, trois, trois mots pour, uh, pour le futur du programme MED. D'abord, la continuité. On ne va pas uh, jeter ce qu'on a déjà fait et de bien. On va uh, s'améliorer sous la capitalisation et la valorisation des résultats. Et on va essayer d'améliorer la coordination en Méditerranée avec les autres programmes euh, qui interviennent dans le même espace. Euh, donc, moi, je voudrais avant tout, euh, si on peut passer, euh, à moins que je mette les contrôles, à euh, la deuxième slide, euh, s'il vous plaît. Euh, je ne crois pas pouvoir le faire, mais euh, si vous passez sur la deuxième page, s'il vous plaît. Non, sur la... Normalement, vous devriez l'avoir, M. Oui, Cervelli. Essayez, s'il vous plaît, avec votre souris. Voilà, je, je, ok, j'ai partagé l'écran, mais... Non, non, sans partager l'écran, normalement, vous pourriez euh, utiliser ma souris. Euh... Si vous bougez votre souris, est-ce qu'elle... Euh... Euh, apparemment, c'est... Voilà. Ah, oui, attendez. Voilà. Là, vous faites comme si vous étiez sur votre propre écran. Oh, ok, parfait. <rire> Merci. 
Euh, donc là, c'est d'abord un mot sur le nouvel espace du programme MED. Il va s'élargir à, à deux nouveaux pays. Ça, c'est important. On va à, inclure la Macédoine du Nord et la Bulgarie. Donc, un intérêt encore plus important sur l'ensemble de la Méditerranée jusqu'à la mer Noire, en passant par les Balkans. Voilà, donc, ce qui représentera dans le futur une ouverture aussi au, à l'arrière-pays euh, de Chine. Euh, pays partenaires. Donc, euh, bien entendu, la, la, Méditerranée, la Méditerranée restera euh, la, le focus central de On arrive à utiliser la souris. Bon. Euh. Ok. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Could you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you carry on. Yeah, OK. Uh, 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 bon, je vais... Est-ce qu'on peut passer à la deuxième slide, si vous avez la main? Parce que moi, je ne l'ai pas. C'est la plus importante, donc uh, si on pouvait... Voilà, parfait. Merci beaucoup. Ouais, merci. Donc, voilà, ça, c'est les futurs programmes résumés à une seule slide. Ce qui est important pour moi, euh, c'est de mettre l'accent sur les trois missions que vous voyez euh, en haut du, de la slide. Donc, sur l'économie euh, euh, d'innovation euh, durable, sur la, évidemment euh, l'environnement et un focus tout particulier sur les zones urbaines euh, avec un aspect dédié évidemment à, à la durabilité. Une mission transversale sur le tourisme durable euh, qui est essentielle en Méditerranée. Sur ces trois missions euh, qui euh, seront, euh, constitueront les centres de, de nos attentions dans le futur, on va construire, euh, on a construit des priorités et, et des objectifs spécifiques que vous pouvez voir juste en, en dessous. Je ne vais pas les détailler parce qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup de temps, mais ce qui est important ici pour moi euh, de souligner, c'est l'effet que, évidemment, euh, le programme Interreg et Euromed, ce sera le nom de, du futur programme va devoir se concentrer lui aussi euh, sur euh, les Green Deal d'une façon importante. Donc, c'est les, les aspects sur preventing and mitigation of risk, uh, supporting energy transition and greener living areas, of course, mais aussi euh, sur l'économie euh, circulaire, sur la gauche euh, du, de la slide, euh, dans le cadre de l'économie de euh, d'innovation. Voilà, donc ça, ce sont les contenus du futur. C'est bon, pour ça que j'ai parlé de continuité. Il n'y a rien qui n'en efface pas euh, déjà dans la programmation 14-20, mais on va accentuer et on va améliorer l'effort que l'on pourra produire. Comment Ce qui est important aussi euh, de souligner, c'est que nous continuerons évidemment à, à favoriser l'approche territoriale par les biais des projets classiques, standards, en faveur de tout acteur qui soit disséminé dans les territoires de notre zone de coopération. Mais on va améliorer aussi la capacité qui sera celle du programme Interreg et Euromed en termes de valorisation des résultats et de capitalisation des transferts. Donc, euh, le programme avait déjà euh, misé, fait un pari important sous l'axe la, gouvernance en 14-20. On va continuer cet effort et, et c'est là où on va rejoindre euh, la, la nouveauté que j'ai un peu anticipé au démarrage, sous une meilleure coordination avec les autres programmes, quels qu'ils soient, qui interviendront dans notre zone de coopération, à la fois des programmes comme Horizon Europe, ou Life, etc., mais aussi et surtout tous les autres programmes interreg transnationaux et transfrontaliers 
qui interviennent dans notre zone de coopération. Ce qui est important vraiment, c'est que l'on fasse, que, l'on, que désormais on assure tous ensemble un effort commun sur des objectifs communs et que l'on puisse créer des synergies et un transfert des résultats vers les acteurs cibles qui sont les nôtres pour euh, nous tous. Donc, il est vraiment essentiel que vous compreniez l'importance de cet aspect parce que c'est là où on va retrouver dans le futur les nouveaux programmes horizontaux sur les communautés thématiques qui seront associés à des projets institutionnels. Donc, les projets euh, communautés thématiques, euh, donc les nouveaux projets horizontaux, auront une valeur euh, double, celle d'assurer à la fois les liens avec les projets territoriaux qui continueront à travailler euh, d'une façon assez traditionnelle dans les territoires, mais aussi et surtout les réseautages et les liens avec les projets institutionnels, donc tout ce que l'on veut euh, exporter en dehors du programme vers les institutions européennes et nationales. Voilà, donc ça c'est vraiment l'effort les maximum que l'on produit dans le futur. Un dernier mot, parce qu'on est en retard, le calendrier. Il y aura un kick-off meeting qui normalement sera probablement organisé en présentiel et en virtuel début décembre à Lisbonne, donc sous présidence portugaise. C'est aussi la présidence annuelle du programme Interagmed et pas seulement celle du, du semestre européen. Donc, un kick-off meeting début décembre. Le programme, quant à lui, euh, devrait être euh, déposé auprès de la Commission européenne euh, dans, les mêmes, euh, dans la même période, donc fin novembre, début décembre. Les premiers appels à projets, chose qui vous touche euh, de plus près, euh, ne devraient pas être officiellement ouverts euh, avant euh, le début de l'année prochaine. Et ce sera normalement un appel sur ISO 1, donc sur les aspects de gouvernance et les aspects institutionnels. Ensuite, suivront euh, les projets territoriaux. Mais on estime que pour répondre à l'architecture qui est la nôtre, aux objectifs et aux cibles qui, que nous avons euh, visées, il est important que les projets gouvernance démarrent avant les projets territoriaux. Voilà, merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kezia. Uh, so, we're you know, a bit pushed for time, so we're now on to our third speaker. So that's Bernard Massabo of the Efficient Buildings Community, General Secretary of the Euromed Cities Network in the city of Nice. Uh, Bernard's an engineer. He's worked internationally in the private sector, then moved to the authority of the Nice Côte d'Azur on urban planning and development. And the Euromed Cities gathers 150 cities into one network on a range of projects for innovation, waste and water management, youth employment, and of course, climate change and energy efficiency. And Bernard is going to speak about the efficient buildings community as a community of practice. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the um, speakers and the kind words um, and already the presentation of the Interagmet program and, and the project by the president of ADEN. I uh, just want to um, uh, stress the fact that we uh, really work um, on, on this project at a territorial level. Um, is it possible for me to um, change the slides? Yes, it is, Bernard. Uh, I do it. Oh, Alison, can, can you do it for me, please? Um, I, I think you just need to click on your own uh, mouse. Can you try, Bernard? Yes, but... Uh... Yeah, exactly. So, as, as this has been already said, this, this uh, efficient building community of projects, it's more than a project because we are uh, coordinating 10 uh, uh, single projects. We try to focus on strategic coordination, communication, and of course, main activities on, 
on transfer and capitalization because this is really the, the objective of the program and what we do is at territorial level and of course the interact program is mainly focusing on the north shore of the mediterranean but also we are working on both shores um, because we think that um, i mean the mediterranean is one territory uh, world territory and we work also, uh, of course, on energy efficiency in public buildings. So we work for the cities, we work for the regions, in fact, we work for all the local authorities, also for energy teams. Um, we are um, very concrete, or we try to be very concrete, and um, it's why all the projects uh, we are coordinating uh, have developed uh, tools um, decision making tools for local authorities mainly. Um, um, some of them, this is very interesting, uh, are uh, dealing with uh, issues related to schools, buildings. And I'm, give, I'm giving a few examples, but these tools are very simple to use, uh, very concrete, and the idea is to encourage the local authorities to use these tools in order to have a better view of. Uh, what they could do um, for their buildings in, in their uh, institution. Um, I'm sorry, but uh, I've lost uh, the presentation. Uh, let me check. I think you went too far. Yes, yeah, sorry. No problem. I can I can bring you back. And Here fact, you are. <laughs> okay. So, in fact, we 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 have uh, analyzed all the tools developed by the uh, the project, the single project, and trying to find the the, the tools which uh, which have the more impact on the territory. Uh, which have already been tested um, to be the, the tools which can be replicated and um, of course uh, which are very um, useful and do not need too much um, technical input from the new receivers from the new authorities and get some technical support from the um, uh, cities or from the partners which have developed these tools so uh, really, as it is mentioned, we try to deliver to or to offer to the local authorities some ready-to-use tools, ready-to-be-used tools. And in terms of uh, transferring, we we are developing several activities. Um, mainly, I uh, would like to highlight three of them: uh, living labs in uh, five uh, partner countries. Uh, from beginning of this year to uh, September 2022 in order to um, uh, create uh, local concrete communities uh, to exchange on the best, best practices. Also capacity building workshops as it was mentioned um, earlier today uh, during this event, Digital Days, we will organize uh, six different uh, capacity building workshops and also um, we, we have proposed um, a, a pilot action, um, which is also very concrete and which has started um, last month. Uh, it's uh, city twinning partnerships between cities from the north shore and cities from south and east shores of the Mediterranean. We, we have selected 16 cities um, representing 11 different countries. And uh, we will work uh, with these uh, cities until uh, June 2022 in order to exchange on uh, a few of these uh, tools and uh, adapt it to, to the cities which have been selected in order for the cities to try to implement these, uh, these tools. Uh, yes, I thank you very much. All, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And it's great to see that capacity building is playing such a large part of all of this. It's, it's so important. 
Um, so thank you. Thanks to the, our three panelists. Um, they're very fantastic talks and quite different perspectives on the, the issue of efficiency in buildings. Um, so we're running behind time. So what we'll do now is we'll just have a one minute break before we go to our uh, next speaker. So just take this, I will give you till seven minutes past 10, uh, 11 um, till uh, have a just have a stretch and then we will come back to um, uh, the aspect of the Croatian Energy Agency and, and what they have to say is our inspirational talk that's coming next. So just, yeah, get up, move your legs, have a quick stretch, fetch a drink of water and we'll be back in a moment. Okay, so look away from the screen, have a break from the screen. Um, so our next topic, uh, so we're going to move on to the next part of the session is to bring in the whole um, the effect of the pandemic and the recovery plans for the pandemic and that as a major governance challenge. So uh, yeah, big topics in themselves. And so next we're going to hear from Julie uh, Domak of the Northwest Croatian Energy Agency and who's also a board member of the Covenant of Mayors. So he's authored over 60 publications uh, on energy policy, forestry economics, biomass and bioenergy, also working in renewable energy and energy efficiency, and now a special advisor on energy and climate at the office of the President of the Republic of Croatia. And we're going to hear on, can our buildings build our better future? So welcome. Well, thank you very much. That's a lot Thanks of heads, obviously. It's, it's, it's a, you've <laughs> done a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, but I, I'm sometimes confused uh, which message I, I should deliver and which <laughs> side I should take. You, I can tell you that, but never mind. That's right. If you're uh, in a topic for long enough, it's, yeah, it's the, yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, but but well, uh, I think the topic today is 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 quite. Uh, Straightforward, and I think we are all on the same side, uh, on the on the on the same side, and on on the safe side, of course. If if we are uh, pushing forward uh, efficient buildings, and it's great to be here, and and uh, well, a lot of uh, colleagues I know, it would be much nicer uh, somewhere uh, around Mediterranean coast, but but never mind. I, I'm sure we will we will have that soon. So so in a ten minutes, I'm going to uh, just very briefly uh, uh, tell you. Uh, some of my, my, my thoughts, can our buildings be, build our better future? And uh, should I, should I uh, tell you when I would like to have a next slide or how does it work actually? Sorry. Hi, Julia, this is Miriam. Uh, you should be able to, to um, use the slides as you like. You can, you can take control of my screen. If you just click next uh, on your mouse, it should move the, the presentation. Uh, if you click in the slide. In the slide, sorry. In the slide. All right. Okay, good. Good, good, good. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, we all know that, that well, building buildings accounts for more than a quarter of uh, uh, EU greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that's uh, that, that's that's very well known fact. And and but what is uh, uh, not so obvious that we, we, we have around 250 million existing buildings. So, so all of them, uh, uh, as well as all new buildings in the EU, EU uh, needs to be net zero carbon buildings. So, so that's quite a challenge, uh, I think. And well, uh, we know uh, about the strategies and uh, well, within uh, all our projects, uh, we, we try to deliver solutions, but obviously, uh, uh, the challenge the challenge is there and it was mentioned uh, already today and i'm really happy that i heard that statement so so it's not only that we need to reduce the need uh, for heating or air conditioning or we need to, to generate renewable energy on site we need now to think uh, about the choice of materials 
and we need to think about the, the, the carbon footprint of that materials. Uh, and that COVID crisis, I think, uh, uh, did some, some good thing, uh, things to us as well, because we are now more, uh, uh, more than ever, I would say, aware uh, that we need to focus on health and on, on well-being, be, well-being uh, when we are thinking about renovations and when we are thinking uh, uh, what, we, what, we, what we would like to do. Just to share, uh, 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 the, the, the Portugal minister said uh, about his country, just to share with you, uh, uh, from creation and uh, national long-term building renovation strategy, we calculated that we need uh, around uh, 32.4 billion euros until uh, 2050 uh, to renovate our buildings and to, to, to well, uh, fulfill the goals uh, we have. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money, uh, well, even for uh, bigger and, 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 and wealthier countries uh, in Europe, not only for Croatia, uh, but uh, in the strategy and, and what we advocate definitely is uh, that we need to use that EU funding as a, uh, as a tool to de-risk and, and to secure uh, uh, affordable financing, but the focus should be on affordable private financing, and the blending is the key. That's, so, so that that would be one of the uh, messages uh, from my side. Uh, uh, do not forget that uh, with with a right strategy, and, and if if we play uh, wisely, we have a potential to create three million new jobs uh, in building sectors in Europe, and that's also something uh, to think about it. Uh, last uh, autumn, uh, we had a, in Croatia uh, our first national roundtable on financing energy efficiency in buildings. And well, uh, apart from that conclusion on financing and blending, uh, uh, it was uh, one of the conclusions was uh, to uh, to try to have, to develop technical assistance uh, uh, assistance uh, program on on a national uh, level. Uh, again, something uh, uh, many European countries are trying to do. Uh, we, we, we should focus, we have unfortunately that experience from, from last year, uh, we should focus on deep renovation on buildings and we should include measures such as earthquake protection, uh, interior design, fire protection. I think uh, all of us in the Mediterranean uh, countries are, are well aware about the, the risk and, and, and the potential uh, uh, catastrophe of an earthquake. Uh, I can tell you we in Croatia uh, last year uh, really had a chance to, 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 to see what can happen uh, uh, with the earthquake. So, so, so that, that should be in, in focus in the, in the future as well. And one very important point would be also to to make better utilization of uh, integrated territorial investment mechanism. We, we have that in most of the countries uh, that would be especially important for cities and, and for urban agglomerations. Uh, very recently, I found out uh, 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 about, about a nice example I wanted to share with you today. Well, I mentioned before te technical assistance. And well, we know, of course, that there is an ELENA program of European investment banks and well, it's 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 an, an, an there is a policy push to, to use that uh, facility more and more, and here is an, an great example from Ireland, how how an unsuccessful Elena project can uh, not only well deliver within the, the scope of the project but can can have a very successful follow up. So so this is an, an a story about Pipperary Energy Agency and Electric Ireland. Uh, who announced a new joint venture named Electric Ireland Superhomes. Well, the, 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 the title, the name of that Elena project in Ireland was Superhomes. So, so, so as a follow-up of the project, uh, uh, the, the regional energy agency, uh, uh, well, like Regea and like many others in Europe, and uh, electric national electric utility uh, will now uh, deliver 35,000 deep home energy upgrade, upgrades by, by 2030. And, and that new electric island super homes scheme will create 200 jobs over the next five years, which is, which is equally important. 
So, so, so this is a good example uh, of a successful follow-up of a technical assistance uh, assistance projects. And just to mention, uh, uh, well, this is a, a recent photo from again uh, from Croatia, from 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 uh, 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 in front of one of our offices where we had a first national uh, Bauhaus dialogue. And and this is another initiative which makes me very uh, excited. Uh, the, 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 the new European Bauhaus initiatives, uh, initiative obviously connects the European Green Deal to our living spaces. And, and we, we, we need, well, the intention is uh, to build together a sustainable and inclusive future that is beautiful uh, for also for our eyes, minds and souls. And that, that reminds me also very much to something uh, uh, so uh, uh, characteristic for Mediterranean, for, well, for, for, the, for the Renaissance. Uh, so, so, so we see that new European Bauhaus as a kind of a little Renaissance uh, in building sector and well, in other sectors, because obviously uh, the, this is a creative and interdisciplinary movement, which will connect science and technology and art and culture. So that's very important. So, so that was some of my, my thoughts, uh, which I wanted to share about the buildings uh, uh, today. Uh, obviously, our buildings in, in 21st century are not uh, just a shelter anymore. Uh, our buildings are a place to live, uh, to study, to work. Our buildings are our heritage. I think uh, we, we should be aware uh, of, of that, especially in our Mediterranean area. Uh, our heritage. Uh, which we need to preserve, uh, but uh, the, the, the buildings are our responsibility uh, as well and can be an important driver for European and, and global economy. Uh, that would be that would be it for the moment. Uh, 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 I hope I hope uh, uh, I stayed within my 10 minutes <laughs> and then. Uh, you did. Thank you very much. That's yeah, and fantastic. And, and it's it's a good reminder that buildings have many purposes. Um, and you're speaking about um, earthquake protection. One of our speakers in the next panel will also come on to that as well. That yeah, there's lots of functions for a building to be considered, not just um, its energy use. Um, thank you. So from now until midday, we have four expert contributors with expertise on governance, building renovation strategies, energy provision, and municipalities. And I'd like us to also hear from all on the forward look out of the pandemic and recovery plans. So each of our four speakers will have three minutes to share their positions. And I will keep to time so that we have time for some discussion. And once all of our four presenters have spoken, I'll have some questions. But if we also take questions from you, so if people want to put questions into the question panel, then that would be great. And you can write your questions either general questions or for specific panelists and we'll see how many questions we can get through. Okay so this session's title is the building strategies of local and regional authorities in post-COVID-19 recovery plans a major governance challenge and first to speak is Marjolaine mernier milfier who is a member of the French National Assembly Vice President of the Sustainable Development Spatial and Regional Planning Committee and the elected president of the HQE CBC Association, which is the professional alliance for the sustainable built environment. So Marjolaine, you have your three minutes. Three minutes for such a, a challenge. That's, uh, that's a challenge in itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, um, yeah, maybe what I can start with is to say that uh, in the last uh, four years, uh, I have been uh, appointed by the French government to, to co-chair the French roadmap to building retrofits. So I've had uh, my eyes set on building retrofits for the last four years, and, and it's been a big part of my mandate. And uh, I have seen a growing interest in building retrofits. In the last four years, uh, this growing interest uh, has come from maybe two reasons, mostly. The first one was the yellow vest crisis that you've all heard of because it rippled across Europe. So obviously you've heard of it. Uh, the spark, as you know, was the new carbon tax on fuel. And that was discussed in 
autumn uh, 2008 and it ignited a strong protest that lasted for months uh, until spring of 2019. The conclusion of that protest was that everyone agreed on fighting climate change and was ready to make sacrifices, but it appeared there would be no major increase in environment policies without social, social justice and fair dealing of the most destitute of our fellow citizens. Under that light, building retrofit appeared as a topic of reconciliation between those who were concerned with the end of the world and those who were concerned with the, their bills at the end of the month. Better housing is both good for the climate and for inhabitants as they don't have to pay as much on heating and they don't get sick as often as they did before. Um, and so building retrofits became a political issue rather than just a technical environmental problem tackled by specialists that it had been so far. The second crisis, of course, is the, the one with the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic. And once again, this crisis served as an accelerator for building retrofits. Uh, not many people know that we already spend about 90% of our time indoors, uh, but the virus uh, took it to another level when government were forced to ask people to stay indoor all day in their homes. And social inequalities were again underlined. It's obviously not the same uh, being stuck for weeks uh, with four people in a single room or having a nice uh, her house with a private garden. And the pandemic also highlighted also the sanitary aspect of building retrofits. It had been a topic of research for years. But again, so far, it had remained uh, known mostly to specialists only. Now everyone is obsessed with indoor air quality, which is a very good thing, uh, of course, as now we can expect all to make uh, real progress in that area. And last but not least, with the pandemic, we have that heavy cloud of economic crisis uh, hanging over our heads. So far, the massive investment conceded by the French government uh, is preventing the worst of it, but uh, of course, everyone is thinking about it. And with 1.5 million workers in the building sector, mostly small businesses dispersed in all uh, territories, all the way to the hearts of the smallest villages, uh, helping that sector uh, uh, to hold in that crisis is also something that is carefully uh, considered these days. So we have a saying in France that is, quand uh, bâtiment va, tout va. When the building sector is doing well, everyone is doing well. Well, <laughs> Uh, all these aspects, you know, merge to make building retrofits a major pillar of the French recovery plan in France. So I won't, in the three minutes, get into the recovery plan itself, but um, uh, all I can say is that um, uh, it's been a massive pillar of it, and we have six, uh, more than six billion euros invested in, in building retrofits in the, last, in the next two years. Uh, the two things I'd like to add in the time that I have uh, are two special targets that we, we are also tackling in France today, and that is the importance of data. We need to know uh, what we are doing uh, and assessing uh, with certainty the impact of government policies is very important. For example, concerning energy insecurity, uh, Four years ago, we had uh, an old study that said that we had seven to eight million households that were um, in those uh, in this uh, area of energy insecurity. And a more recent survey indicated that uh, we would be closer to five million. So it's a very different thing having five million people under the threshold of energy poverty or having uh, eight millions. So it is important to know how many ref retrofit we are doing each year and also to what uh, effect exactly uh, we are, what results we are expecting from them. So we have been uh, in the last two years working on an observatory uh, that would be able to give us more uh, specific and more, um, you know, solid data to build our policies on. So that was the first uh, thing I wanted to, to say. And the second thing I wanted to highlight uh, was the training of professionals. As I said, the building sector represents about uh, 140 billion euros a year in France. It's 1.5 million workers among which uh, 500,000 work alone and have no employees in France. We have a very low unemployment rate uh, of 3%. So the problem is more finding the people to recruit than, than having unemployment issues in that sector. 
uh, since 2008, 25% of the workforce uh, achieved the age of retiring and uh, well-deserved retirement, but uh, we are uh, facing a problem of recruiting and finding new generations, finding their way into that, um, that sector of work. And 40% uh, of businesses express difficulties to find new recruits. So maybe what I would like to end on to, to our opening statement is that uh, probably the next big challenge now that we have established that building retrofit is one of the key pillar um, to, uh, to fighting global change, um, we now need, we have found the money now, thanks to the huge um, uh, recovery plans uh, set about uh, all over Europe. And now maybe it is time for us to invest, now that we've invested in the buildings, to invest in the people that will actually tackle the renovations for us, uh, you know, day to day in their, in their work. So yeah. maybe invest in the people as well and in their training. Thank you very much. Yes, I yeah, I completely agree. The yeah, the individual skills and 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 judging the competency of those people so that you've got competent people carrying out the work that needs to be done is is, is essential. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And also like the comment about um, perhaps people being more aware of their environment when they've been forced to spend more time indoors too. I, I certainly am. <laughs> okay, a little ten so percent that made all the difference. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, that's a good point. Yes, yes. How liberty can be. Yes, no, that's, that's a very good point. Um, okay, so next we have. Have Pep Morales, who is Deputy General Director of Architecture and Housing for the Government of Catalonia. So he is an architect and has worked at the Government of Catalonia for the last 16 years. So Pep, uh, your three minutes, your opening statement, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I will try to just uh, uh, put the focus in, 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 in one of the things that I, th uh, that I uh, guess it's, it's really important from the government's point of view. Uh, we must take into account that uh, to achieve all the global uh, goals in terms of uh, sustainability, you know, the, the sustainable development goals, we must do concrete actions. Okay, We will not achieve uh, the sustainable development goals without uh, changing windows, without uh, improving our energy efficiency in, in our buildings or in our uh, homes. Uh, so how, how can we uh, arrive to the people, uh, to the human scale from the global scale? So we are always talking about uh, sustainable development goals in terms of global uh, goals, but uh, these global goals, we must, uh, we must make them arrive to the human scale. So, so the concrete the scale, the families, the, the, the people in the street, okay? So uh, it, this is uh, one of the main things that we are working on, uh, uh, implementing, designing, and creating regional strategies that uh, allows the, the, the change of scale. So uh, I like to talk about the intervention, the different intervention scales. We must know in each moment in which scale we must work. But to arrive to the human scale, we must, uh, how to say, it? Uh, we must go down from, from, from a very top scale to the, to the human one. So th this is one of the things that we are working on uh, in, in, in the framework of the architectural quality in the framework in our own uh, urban agenda and in the, in the framework of our own uh, national plan of urban uh, renewal, okay? So uh, this, um, uh, from, this is from one point of view and from the other point of view, uh, we, uh, at least in Catalonia and, and in Spain, uh, all, all the issues related to uh, energy renovation, uh, energy uh, renova the renovation, sorry, uh, are managed from different departments in the different governments. So I think that this is a kind of barrier uh, that we put ourselves in, in the way. Okay, so it, it, this is not a barrier because of the sector is quite difficult because of the man, managing the, the implementation of these strategies is quite difficult. No, this is a, a, a barrier that we create ourselves. 
we are doing it quite difficult, okay? So there's the Department of Energy, the Department of uh, Housing, the Department of Urban Planning. So if we don't create uh, a lack of uh, coordination, uh, a lack of uh, uh, institution that coordinates every department in this matter, we will continue uh, going uh, year uh, and years, um, everything, uh, everyone looking to each own our own objectives, but not in the global objectives that uh, I think it's uh, one of the points that we should uh, focus on. And this is just a couple of things I, I, I just want to... I yeah, just that, want that's, to that's great. And, uh, and, and this is the thing with the sustainable development themselves and goals themselves is that the idea that they're interlinked as well. And it, it just shows that that's reflected in everything and putting things into silos just doesn't help any of this. So, but and that is a barrier in itself to overcome. Yes, thank, thank you. OK, so we'll we'll move on to uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, Rodriguez, who is has a PhD in engineering and industrial management and a varied career in sustainable energy with expertise in solar photovoltaics. And Maria is the technical and financial director of Lisbon's Energy and Environment Agency. So Maria, give us your thoughts for three minutes. Hi everyone, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will just uh, try to focus a little bit on what's the, the now the strategy in Lisbon. So uh, it's uh, widely acknowledged that uh, the pandemic implied a new way of working, putting a higher focus on residential buildings as the place to live and work. And, and buildings are in fact uh, are responsible in Lisbon for over 45% of greenhouse gas emissions. So we have been working over the years in, in action plans such under the covenant of mayors. And now more recently, we are um, almost approving a new climate action plan that has been developed uh, under the C40 networks, Global City Network. And uh, we have ambitious uh, reduction targets. We are looking at 70% reduction target in 2030 as compared to, uh, to 2002. And so, of course, that buildings and, of course, mobility and transport, we are a tertiarized uh, city, so these are the main, the main sectors where we have to focus. And uh, we have also a very ambitious uh, goal, a long-term goal to, on 2050 to eradicate energy poverty in the city. So we have a, a strategy that is focused, I would say, in four principles as a whole. Uh, first of all, a little bit as Magdalene already said, we have to know how to better act. So we have to go in deeper into the knowledge of, uh, namely in, in what comes to energy poverty, we have to have a better understanding of the problem in the city. Of course, we have to understand also that this is a, a kind of a trilemma based on, on three aspects on the bill itself, on comfort and on health. And so we're about to launch a, a uh, a survey to to Lisbon citizens, so to for us to better know, so to better act uh, under in this problem. Another pillar that has been also addressed here is information and capacitation. We cannot go around this. This is quite important, not only empowering citizens to act. Uh, but also economic agents and, of course, all the skills that we need to, to better uh, intervene in our territory. And we are very focused on having proximity strategies, working with communities such as neighborhood associations, so that we can do these this activation moments, we have the sustainment, and we have to uh, go through the process with people, help them to, to, to reduce their, their uh, risk perception in intervening and giving them the tools to intervene. And of course, in this strategy, not only this work with communities, but also having in place a very strong one-stop shop is very important for us, and we're looking at doing this. And this connects with the inclusivity and active citizen involvement solutions. We have to uh, be creative and, and, and co-creating the solutions with people, not imposing anything uh, at front. 
And finally, I would say that we have to have locally managed uh, financial mechanisms, namely in these funds that come from the Recovery and Resilient Fund. We are uh, looking very forward to, to, see, um, to, to see how does this put in place as our ministry uh, um, has been saying that some transfer of funds will be done to municipalities. And we think this is a fundamental uh, issue so that we can go through integrated approaches to the territory um, and, and be more effective, not looking only at flats, but looking at the building the, as a whole, the quarter as a whole, and intervening in a more uh, systematic and, and um, quicker, I would say, quicker way in the territory. So this is, these are my, my main uh, thoughts. That's right great. Now. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Okay, and I should say, so, so if anybody wants to put some questions in the Q&A, please do. Uh, we have one panelist to just introduce themselves in a moment, but please please put some questions. Um, we, we can have um, a discussion until uh, the end of this session. Um, so our next speaker is Mayor Rosella Sendron. Rosella has been the Mayor of Silea for four years and was a councillor for 10 years prior to that. And it's a municipality near Tre Trevesio, which is 30 kilometers from Net Venice. And she's provided over renewing the school building stock. Uh, and as our previous say, uh, presenters have talked about, for earthquake protection as well as energy efficiency. So, Rosella, your three minutes. Oster? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, I will bring you the point of view of a mayor of our 10,000 uh, uh, inhabitants uh, town. And uh, I, I really, I'm really convinced that after um, this, this event, if, even more after this pandemic event, uh, um, that the future of the Chaldean urban structure, but also of all uh, Europe, uh, uh, along with my town, my region, will, will increasingly depend on the ability to rethink and redesign the use of space, because the, the new urban context cannot and must not uh, start from the consumption of new land but it must originate from the renewal of the existing building stock. The, the urban regeneration pro process is made even more urgent by the health emerger, um, emergency uh, triggered by the spread of COVID-19 uh, uh, virus, which has impacted in the way people experience the cities, workplaces, their, their own homes, public, public spaces for free time, public utilities as well. Uh, the cities today uh, face new challenge, challenges, impro improving uh, the quality of life and offering people easy access to the wide, um, a wide range of essential services, from transports, for example, to green areas, from health inf infrastructures, to cultural, cultural and digital in infrastructures. The urban renovation therefore represent, represent for us an extraordinary opportunity to rethink cities and town and to put back at the center the people well-being. At the same time, is a great opportunity for economic, social and cultural revival for the communities. And the recovery plan will be uh, an accelerator for all this issue. And uh, I, I will do some practical example uh, of, change, of changes already in act. For example, in my town in Silea, um, in the, pro the project approved be between uh, uh, 2020 and 2021, we required wider spaces, planning to ensure different distance, distances and safety uh, among people, especially in school buildings. And uh, for example, we required improved air circulation systems. 
um, another change method that is already in uh, in act uh, for that uh, that uh, affect uh, the way of planning in the cities is also the fact that cafe restaurants and hotels had wide widened uh, widened their stellage to increase the number of table and possible customers so that they are mm, we have already changes in act that that we can see uh, and the, the fact that, that covid 19 affects also costs and consumption because many people practice smart working, organized meeting and social activity using ICT. So this is another factor to consider. And to, to sum up, uh, uh, we, we, we are at the point of no return because uh, public and private building need to be conceived or made totally or almost self-sustainable in terms of energy. And so that is the challenge, the challenge we have now, and uh, we have to take the whole opportunity to do it now. That's great. Thank you very much. And I, I just have one question. So, what, so obviously this is a massive challenge. But what what do you find are the most useful policy policy instruments to promote the building renovations um, for your city? Yeah, uh, I think uh, um, I think that there is a, a really extraordinary measure now active in Italy that is uh, um, moving moving now our attention from public buildings to the general being the stock present in the in the city. The most useful uh, instrument at national level in Italy is center, certainly represented by the package of uh, extraordinary measure promoted by the so-called uh, relaunch de degree, il decreto rilancio uh, of uh, last of May uh, 2020, that has increased to 110 percent the rate of deduction due for the intervention as energy requalification work, seismic risk deduction, reduction, installation of a photovoltaic uh, system and uh, of columns for recharging, recharging electronic uh, vehicles. So one of the main updates regards the possibility to use the so-called super bonus not only as a deduction from our from our own taxes, but also through the so-called so-called invoice discount. This way, it had, it can be granted by by the supplier through the transfer of credit to third parties, including banks, for example, and insurance company. And this is really an instrument that is going very very well to. Uh, to promote the building renovation in our city. Um, if we move, for example, at regional or local level, um, building and energy efficiency is promoted by incentives uh, and grants in order to change old boilers with high efficiency boilers. So in this moment, uh, these measures are going very well in Italy and they are uh, used and going directly to the goal of uh, building renovation. Okay, that's something, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, incentives, yeah, and the, the correct incentives at the right time is, is always a, yeah, a difficult challenge. So, so we're just, so there's, if anybody would like to put some questions into the question and answer panel, that would be great. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll, we'll go back to Pep. Um, so, so obviously, you know, energy efficiency policies are, are a struggle for every European country, but it, but it seems especially so in Spain. Um, so what are, the, what are the biggest challenges that you face in the implementing, um, you know, efficiency buildings, uh, energy strategies? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that uh, one of the difficulties of the, uh, another barrier is uh, trying to concern people about this issue. Because in many cases, uh, there are uh, different priorities uh, in the managing of the buildings. I mean, first of all, you need that everything is okay in your building. I mean, uh, I mean an structural 
a, a revision and a structural uh, uh, keep keep keeping the building um, solid. Okay. Yeah. Then keeping uh, take care about uh, that every building uh, would be able to be used for elderly people. I mean, uh, maybe lifts, uh, maybe other kind of uh, uh, mm, renovation, not in terms of energy, but in terms of uh, social uh, uh, renovation. I mean, uh, everyone should be able to arrive to their own uh, flat. And in many cases, this is not uh, possible. And uh, these are, uh, in, in, in the mindset of the people, of the citizens, uh, this is before, this comes before than the uh, renovation in terms of energy efficiency. So we should have to work uh, in terms of um, doing the renovation, the energy renovation, according as, uh, at the same time that we do, that, that we, uh, do the other kind of uh, renovations needed by the buildings, in the buildings. So maybe in the, in the Spanish or in the Catalan case, we should have to uh, give subsidies, not only in the renovation of the energy efficiency uh, in the buildings, but in these uh, different parallel problems that uh, citizens have in their buildings. Because if not, it, uh, they will not afford uh, even uh, if, if we give 70% uh, of, the, of the budget uh, with subsidies or, or whatever, uh, they will not do it because they have another kind of priorities. Yes, quite. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I understand that completely. Yes, yes. Competing. Yes, it's just not the priority for everybody. And, and how do you solve that? Yeah. So, yeah, good point. Um, so we'll come back to Marjolaine. Um, so we haven't talked much about the legal framework. So how does France's legal framework push for action and how does France assure, assure that the local and regional needs are truly considered in a national strategy and then how can we link national productions and on the ground actions but yeah let, let's talk about some legal issues uh, yeah uh, it, it's always interesting uh, crossing viewpoints from uh, from around Europe because we we see that we share common uh, difficulties and common interests and it's always nice that having uh, finding uh, you know echoes <laughs> of our own situations abroad um what i could pick up from uh, from uh, what rosella just said is that it's difficult we have to uh, help people get involved uh, by themselves uh, pushing incentives so that they they will uh, tackle the subject and go go there willingly but at the same time, we also know, as uh, Joseph just said, that it is very difficult to interest people in uh, in their housing renovations. Um, so the, the main problem maybe is to, to make them know what is to be done uh, by 2050. And that's one thing that we have been doing. We've been uh, making that roadmap more um, you know, visible for people. And uh, from uh, 2022, uh, everyone will receive every time that you change situation from housing, you know, selling it or high, uh, uh, renting a new place, you will have information as to the situation uh, in of your uh, of your housings, uh, what you rent and what you can expect as energy, uh, uh, you know, bills and uh, and all sort of things like that. And this will help make people understand, we hope, uh, what the situation is and what needs to be done by 2050. So that's one thing. And at the same time, uh, because today, nowadays, we know that 67% of people think that they have nothing to do for their housing. They, they think that ha their homes are perfect, are just as they are, and they think they've done what they needed to do. So they think all we are doing and saying about building renovations uh, actually don't apply to them. So it's something that we need to make them understand that uh, indeed it's not just because the paint is nice and you know yeah. the the general aspect of the building is uh, is agreeable that you don't have to to tackle the problem. So that's something that we need to change scales about and also make bring it to other issues as well because like decorations and uh, you know comforts and uh, health and not just energy. 
Yeah. So this is what we are a bit shifting about in discourse these days. And also um, uh, with legal obligations, we are also making it uh, um, more mandatory to, to tackle the problem. For example, uh, the law will now force people to renovate their housings if they want to keep renting it. If it's in a poor state, now people will have to renovate their housings or it will no, no longer be able to be rented uh, and that's by 2022. Uh, voilà. And we also said that uh, energy, um, poor energy efficiency is also uh, indecent. Uh, and that is something that we inscribed within the law as well. So it helps uh, people having more um, tools to uh, go towards their landlords, for example, and, and make them act uh, and make the, the building renovations. So it's uh, it's a fair, fairly difficult way to, to you know to 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 help with those lines because if you push too far with the obligations, you you have a risk of uh, finding yourself in a breaking point and mm -hmm. people will no longer go with you. And that's the you know the yellow vest movement that I mentioned yeah, earlier yeah. on. We we don't want to live that again. So <laughs> we are fairly prudent uh, as what we can do. But at the same time, uh, people are also pushing us very, um, very far and going further. There was uh, this um, uh, uh, citizen convention. I don't know if you've heard of it in France, but uh, uh, there was this uh, original idea that came from President um, Macron. Uh, who said we are going to uh, to to uh, you know uh, with a lottery ask 150 people to think about those uh, environmental issues and and ask them to think about it and find solutions and actually the solutions that they uh, came up with were actually very much more radical than any political uh, actor would have dared dream yes <laughs> you know even the most uh, ferocious environmentalists wouldn't have dared uh, impose that. So actually, when people are informed, when they are, they have the um, uh, the data given to them, they become very more active, and that's yeah. maybe what we need to to be doing. Yeah, I, I had heard about that. So that's where the um, no internal flights more than was it two or four hours that, that exactly. you'd have to take the train instead. Yes. So I, yeah. Yeah. There you're were right. um, there were a lot of uh, positions, and uh, but some of the strongest ones were for building reno renovations because uh, that's where they wanted to triple, quadruple the number of renovations that we had to do, force global re renovations, and no longer. Uh, you know, part renovations as we as we were doing before. So, but the the fact was that 150 people became convinced, but we still had the rest of the population to deal with. Though yeah. we couldn't yeah. go as far as they <laughs> they said. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we've got um, a question from the chat. So, um, this is to you, Maria, but. We'll see if we, let's let's go with this. So, do regions and municipalities have the necessary technical assistance to implement renovation strategies? So, does the construction sector have the necessary abilities to perform the renovations that need to be done? Ah, oh, interesting question. <laughs> I would say that it's a two-part question, of course, and um, I would say that um, uh, the municipalities uh, are quite assisted by now by the at least in Lisbon we have uh, in the, the energy agency we are kind of this uh, technical assistant partner that we are trying to capacitate the municipality nam namely in terms of green uh, uh, green purchasing strategies and also in the building sector but of course here we are talking about municipal uh, initiatives and, uh, and of course, within their own uh, uh, buildings, service buildings, and also these this new housing programs that we are, we are assisting, also schools and everything. Uh, but I do think that uh, more than technical assistance, we need to find new governance models in the municipalities so that, um, and it, it has been a very interesting uh, process that we are doing these green commitments like, uh, um, 
uh, within the, the municipality so that all the departments or all, all people that may be involved in these renovation strategies are well committed to, to follow the same path and, and target the same goals. So this is also a revolution that we need. As for the construction sector, I think we have to invest a lot in, in, in training. That's, that's for sure, it has been mentioned here already, and this, this is a, a must do. We need to find new, new capacitation centers that even centers that can go for, for these new tools, uh, virtual reality assisted training programs and this kind of, uh, of strategies that I think they are most important for us to, 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 to do, do it, but do it well without so many problems at, uh, uh, afterwards, after the implementation. We have been assisting some problems that uh, there are good intentions and buildings are intervened, but then they are not intervened properly. And uh, we we tackle a problem and create another problem. So we now have yeah. to we have to we have to invest a lot on that. Yes. And and where do you think that um, I mean anybody in the panel is welcome to answer this, but 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 if the if the construction centre needs training in order to improve energy efficiency in buildings, you know who who's best place to provide that training or, or maybe who's best place to fund that training who's best place to put money into that who you know whose responsibility is that if anybody from the panel wants to answer on that I, I can give you my view and then I'll pass on so what, what uh, we have a, a, a national institute for uh, employment and training and so this would be and it's professional training mostly so I would say this would would be a necessary partner we have to involve them but I think also that municipalities local authorities can have a role on that and of course, funding should uh, should come. I would say mostly centrally, but I think that that should also be uh, a, a good blend of private and public um, funds. I would say that that's for sure uh, something that uh, we have to engage the, the construction industry in investing themselves also in, in this in this in this path. And I think it's important to have them involved. Yeah, thank you. And, and does anybody else want to respond on that? Yeah, maybe I can add something uh, as to how it's uh, organized in France. In France, uh, we have uh, in our governing model, uh, we have the de department uh, which is in charge of energy poverty, the regions that are in charge both of energy and so energy production and uh, like uh, renewable energies and also energy efficiencies. Um, and then you have, uh, of course, the cities uh, that is actually the area in which, uh, you know, craftsmen actually work because they, they don't go further than 20 kilometers or something like that. So the regions is much too large uh, for it to be the right scale. So it's actually always a question of cooperation between the, the various scales. But funding uh, training actually comes uh, in France to the regions because they are both in charge of uh, energy efficiency and of training and the economy. So it's actually there that we, we, we could have the most effort, um, but at the same time, of course, the, the governments have uh, national uh, strategic plans uh, for everything, so they can add up money <laughs> to the table and, and help the regions to, to, you know, to support their own uh, financing. But uh, it's actually at the region levels, I think that uh, that would be best. Yeah, and that's great. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thanks to all of our panelists this morning. That's a really nice note to end on because tomorrow we will be talking about funding and private um, public partnerships. Uh, but that's great. Some, some great messages this morning. The, the point that, that it's difficult to convince people of the importance of energy efficiency in buildings because buildings have so many roles to play in people's lives. Um, and that interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work is also really important. So cutting down, so not having silos, but keeping things together and keeping talking to as many people as you can to make this important to as wide groups as possible. Um, so that's it for the discussion this morning. Uh, again, I'd just like to thank everybody, all of our speakers, there's fantastic contributions from everybody. And now um, Geordie's going to talk about what's happening tomorrow. And we also have a survey for you. So in the closing couple of moments, 
two things. So this is, yeah, this is our session. So there's a session this afternoon on capacity building um, and that's using CCAP and the sustainable development goals within the framework of the Covenant of Mayors. And then as you see on the screen there, we've got um, other activities the rest of this week, uh, this afternoon, all day Tuesday and all day Wednesday. And I'll be back tomorrow morning and on Wednesday morning for moderating the policy sessions. So Geordie, and the, yeah. oh, and the surveys in the chat as well, if you can, yeah. Okay, Think, thanks a lot, Vicky, and thank you. all the panelists, also for the, all the people joining us today. Oh, and I should thank the interpreters, I should, <laughs> before I forget. Thank you to our interpreters, great work. <laughs> okay, so again, thank, thanks to, to all the panelists to, to, to join us, also for the, all the attendance for the today's session. It was quite amazing session At the beginning quite difficulties on technical issues but later on it was just all working well and it was quite interesting to hear all the opinions about this challenging topic about how to implement the recovery funds as vicky mentioned to the, tomorrow we will have a second session during the morning which would be the second policy session more regarding to the financial uh, topics that means how to implement this financial uh, huge recovery funds from the financial point of view and that means that we will have two round tables the first one would be more related to the public part of these financial schemes how these uh, public entities at different levels or national regional local levels will be able to face uh, how to implement this uh, Again, huge amount of money in, in the renovation wave. And the second round table that would be more related to the private uh, point of view, uh, how these private entities, I mean, uh, hedge funds, funds or what uh, specific banks, whatever, they would be able to collaborate with the uh, public entities also to try to implement this uh, recovery funds in the smarter way possible in a short time that we have to follow in. So, so we hope that tomorrow we can, you, all of you can join us and just, uh, just have this interesting two tables, strong tables about this financing topic. Thanks to all of you. Thanks everybody. See some of you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.